Hi, everybody. Welcome. So we'll try to keep it to an hour. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Happy Health Literacy Month. Really excited uh, to be able to be here talking with all of you about skills-based health ed and thinking about how that supports our overall um, health literacy work and journey. Um, I also want to make sure that I give a shout out to our Health Education Council. Um, I know, Stacey, are you our only member from our Health Ed Council, as Lisa, as of right now? I believe so, yes. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you to our whole Health Education Council for all the awesome stuff that you have been doing, especially helping us plan and give, you know, have some great resources and activities and ideas for Health Literacy Month. I'm Dr. Sarah Bennis, she, her pronouns. I am an assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University, um, and I am also your current um, Shape America president. So uh, the intended outcomes for this session, keeping in mind it's only an hour, um, which is just kind of, you know, touching the surface of all the things that we could go into related to skills-based health ed. Um, but I hope that by the end of this hour, you're able to discuss core aspects of skills-based health education and that you're able to recognize elements of a skills-based approach in different curriculum and examples and really think about how what we're talking about tonight sort of applies to your own practice um, and maybe, you know, the practice within your department or colleagues. Um, I also don't want to forget to say um, that you are welcome to put questions in the chat or you can just raise a hand and come or, you know, whatever you want to do. I, again, I'd love to keep this interactive as much as possible, um, but also want to try to make sure that I answer or not a but. And also want to make sure that I answer folks' questions um, so that you all feel as comfortable as possible um, with skills based health ed after this presentation. So these are going to be our essential questions for our time together. One of the things I tried to do, even though it's kind of hard online and in such a short period of time, but model some of the things that we might see in a health education classroom. So you know, some of us use essential questions in our curriculum. This is also something that you can do, which is an active learning strategy, um, is having the essential questions. So the two that we have for tonight are what is skills-based health education? And then where is my practice in relation to a skills-based approach? And I'll invite you to reflect on those again um, at the end, but those are kind of what our focus is going to be for tonight. All right, so here's our first opportunity for engagement. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it to the chat for now. So I invite you to think of the last time that you learned to do something new. What did you do or need to do in order to help you learn? So like think of a new skill or behavior, like what did you need to do in order to learn that skill or what did you need to help you learn? So if you wanna put it in the chat or if folks are around and can come off mute, I mean, you're welcome to, but. I know that sometimes if camera's off, it maybe means that you can't also come off. Yeah, thanks. So watch a YouTube video, broke it down into smaller tasks and goals. Thanks, Stacey and Nicole. Yeah, so maybe had to know the steps or broke it down into steps, researched it, practiced. Awesome. Just going to wait because I feel like there's always a little bit of a lag. Yeah, ask for help. So important. Yeah, and the chance to practice. So thanks, everybody. So those are all things that are going to be true in our health education classroom, right? So we're going to need to find ways to, what I interpret from the watching the YouTube videos is we needed modeling, right? So how are we going to model things for our students? A few of you talked about practice, making sure we have real practice opportunities for students where they're applying the skill, having opportunities for peer support, teacher support, maybe support from trusted adults or community helpers, right? So everything that you just said, research, right? Understanding what the skill is, what the steps are, like how do I actually do this thing that I you know, want to do? Those are all gonna be core elements that we're gonna talk about tonight in terms of a skills-based approach. So one of the things that I think is really helpful to think about um, is the fact that this idea of skill development is transferable to a lot of different situations. And if for those of you who also teach phys ed, it's the same, it's a similar mentality, maybe not exactly the same, but a similar mentality in terms of it's like a limited amount of direct instruction. And it's a lot of opportunity for practice in different settings and different contexts. It's scaffolded. So it advances in challenge. So like that same mindset is going to show up in your skills-based health course. And I think the other thing that's kind of cool to think about is like you just put in the chat, you know, whether it's like learning, I didn't ask you what the skills were, right? But like, whether it's like replacing something on your lawnmower or learning to ski or knit or learn a new language, 
like everything that you're going to take your students through um, is going to transfer into different areas of their life. So there's lots of not only the skills themselves, but the process of skill development. All right. So let's make sure that we're on sort of the same page about what a skills-based approach is. So when I'm saying a skills-based approach, I'm basically meaning what you see on the screen, which is a planned, sequential, comprehensive, and relevant Sorry about the motorcycle that just went by. I don't know if you could hear that. Um, relevant set of learning experiences implemented through socio-ecological and socio-cultural perspectives and participatory methods in order to support the development of skills, attitudes, and functional knowledge needed to maintain, enhance, or promote health and well-being of self and others across multiple dimensions of well-being. It's a lot of words on the slide, which I know is not sort of what you're supposed to do. Um and we're going to talk about many of these elements, but what I want to just point out about this, this definition, in addition to like, we're going to dive into more, is it, it actually changed from like Holly and um, my like initial understandings of skills-based, like we've grown in our understandings and our definition of skills-based health has changed as we've learned more and done more work and kind of grown more along with like the educators that we worked with. So I just want to sort of say that, that, you know, um, this is sort of like where it's at now, but it might continue to evolve, right? And the way that you implement this in your different settings, you know, like it's going to come alive in different ways, um, but it's definitely something that is still, you know, it's a work in progress. Like I always laugh when I ask folks, like, you know, if you had to say on a scale of one to five, you know, one being not really familiar and five being expert, what number would you say? And people say five. I'm like, I don't even think I would say five, you know, because it's just, it's always evolving. And the more that, you know, I get to work with teachers or kind of practice this in different ways, like I'm learning more too. So we're going to dive into the key things. But one thing I do want to also highlight is one of the key shifts was, because I think this is a, an important thing for us to think about in health ed in general, was a shift away from a focus on um, like the individual. So our, our previous definition focused more on um, like personal health and well-being, and we expanded it to take into that idea of self and others um, to recognize that like, it's actually really important that we move being inclusive of the individual skills that you need, but help people see how they're connected to their communities and how our individual health is actually really connected to our collective health. And that the skills that we're helping students develop will help their own health and well-being. And we want them to see how that's connected within their communities and their relationships and beyond their individual selves. So this is just a visual um, to represent, you know, the definition that you just saw. What I want to highlight here um, is, again, this is all sort of intentional, right? So we see the socio-ecological and socio-cultural perspective. That's like the um, context that we're thinking about health education within. So we have to take that sort of step back and look at the bigger picture. And then specifically within skills-based health education, we see that skill development is the biggest piece of the puzzle, right? Because that's where our focus is. It's on the skills. The skills are the things that are going to transfer. The skills are the tools that students can take with them for a lifetime. So that's the biggest piece of the puzzle. The next biggest piece is participatory methods. So skills-based health ed isn't just about aligning with the standards. And it's not just about, you know, like having... Um, decision making, you know, one lesson in your in your curriculum. It's also really about like how we engage students, right? And thinking about what that looks like. And then the smallest piece, which is not, you know, it's still important, but it's not the focus is functional information. So we'll talk about all those pieces, but just to kind of give you a visual to think about like the relative importance of these different elements within the approach. Um, hopefully this is a good visual. Um, so socio-ecological and socio-cultural perspectives. So there's two main things, again, that I sort of want to reflect on um, what you see here. So the first is that on the left, the um, kind of purple graphic, that's a socio-ecological perspective where we're recognizing that our health and well-being is impacted by factors at all these levels. So at the individual level, the relationship level, the community level, and societal level. So at the individual level, it's things like our knowledge, attitudes, skills, um, beliefs. I don't think I said values, right? But it's like things about us individually. It could also be genetics, right? But it's those things that are like our individual to each of us. Then our relationships, our family, our coaches, our mentors, our teachers, 
um, you know, our religious leaders that we might, you know, work with. It's like those sort of relational things. Then we have community. What are the social determinants of health that are present in my community? Do I have access to fresh fruits and vegetables? You know, do I have access to, um, you know, health clinics? Are the sidewalks in my community walkable? Do we have safe outdoor space, right? So it's kind of characteristics of the community. And then we have societal. So what are the, you know, like laws and regulations at a society level? You know, what's kind of going on in the current, climate like you know we're seeing right now a lot of um anti-transgender you know laws and legislation we're seeing a lot of anti-lgbtqia um you know legislation and book bans and these things right that's all part of the societal context that is impacting our health and well-being right like those are all things that are shaping the context in which we are navigating health and well-being so that's the sort of socio-ecological perspective is to recognize that there are factors at all these different levels um, that can impact our health and well-being. And then, you know, you sort of see in the next model on the right-hand side, it's similar, but it kind of gets even more at really thinking through what are some of the elements at these different levels that also relate to that idea of like culture, right? And 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 culture meaning you know, in the broadest sense of the way that we could identify a culture, right, in terms of groups that we belong in. And then we also think about it, it's sort of more broadly about um, things like, again, what's happening in the big picture, you can see on the screen on like the bottom right hand side, historical and intergenerational trauma, right? Like those are also factors that are um, connected to what's influencing our health and well being. So just to understand that as we are teaching health education, and let's think of an example, right? So if we take the skill of decision-making, when we're teaching the skill of decision-making, a student's ability to decide related to certain, let's use maybe ATOD, right? Um, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, that is gonna be impacted by messages from parents and guardians. That's gonna be potentially impacted by you know, if they're members of a spiritual community, the messages that they've been receiving, it's going to be impacted by the availability in their community, right? Like what is access like to alcohol, tobacco, other drugs? Um, it's going to be related to laws about legality of when you can access alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, right? So like we could look at, you know, any of the skills that we're thinking about and recognize like how, um, all these different layers are going to potentially impact those skills. So all of this is to say, and I'm trying to be mindful of time, um, that we're not teaching health education in a vacuum. And everything that you see on the screen is impacting all of our lives and all of our students' lives. And the impacts that they have um, can contribute to their health and well-being, right? And so I just, I say that to, to say, I'm not, we're not, you know, when I say we, I'm usually referring to Holly and I, since a lot of this work we've done together, Holly Alperin. Um, it's not necessarily that you have to like teach this in your class, though you could maybe, especially with like your high school students. It's more that we want folks to be thinking about what are the factors in my community and in the larger, you know, society that are impacting our students and how do we help them navigate those challenges, right? Like how do we help them understand that the fact that, you know, again, just going back to food availability, like if they're living in a food desert, the fact that it's hard for them to access fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, that's a systemic issue, right? That's a, that's a community societal issue that's tied to all sorts of things. Um, that is resulting in the situation that they're in, right? And so we wanna just be thoughtful about what that looks like in our health classroom and make sure that we're attending to the fact that um, all these things are constantly influencing us all the time. So I get all excited and I can't talk anymore. <laughs> um, so I wanna provide an opportunity for some processing. Um, can I maybe just get like a thumbs up either like, you know, you can actually use your actual thumbs up or just the virtual thumbs up. Are people able to go into breakout rooms? 
Like if we put you in breakout rooms, are folks able to to talk? I see some thumbs. Okay. So maybe Audra, can you help me? Like, can you see the folks who are in, who kind of gave a thumbs up and maybe, I don't know if it's, it's too much trouble. And if it is, we don't have to do it this way, but if we could put those folks in a breakout room and then I'll keep the other folks here and we'll just kind of use the chat um, for the folks who can't go into a breakout room. Does that make sense, Audra? Yeah, let me try to assign some. Folks. Yeah, so I think like everyone who just turned their camera on, which thank you, that was really helpful, could be in a breakout room. And then no worries for everybody else. We'll just use the chat and we'll kind of use that function while the other folks are in a breakout room. So here's the question um, or questions that I'd invite you to talk about. And Audra, let's just keep it. Um, let's keep it quick, like five minutes, maybe. Um, so I know it's going to be a short discussion, but just for a chance for you to talk to each other and not just be listening to me. Um, what are some ideas you have for ways that socio-ecological and socio-cultural perspectives might shape how and what you teach in health ed? I gave some examples, but would love for you all to think of more. And then what do we as health educators need to do in order to use or consider these approaches in our practice? And also, I don't know, Stacy or Audra, if you can maybe put those prompts in the chat too for the folks that, thank you. Because if I, if I stop sharing if, or if I try to click to it, it'll go away paying attention to the demographics of our school. And I'm actually just having my students um, do an assignment like this, where not only um, do they have to think about the demographics of the school, but they also have to do like a little bit of a community assessment to think about like, what are some of the facilitators and barriers within their community um, and their pre-service teachers, um, you know, relative to health and well-being that they might want to take into account. Yeah. So Pam, I think I just, we were on the same wavelength, right? So understanding what is available to students, you know, and being mindful of how to help them access what is available. And even thinking about like what options might there be for things that aren't available for students in your community. Yeah. As they say, great minds think alike, right? Although my daughter was like, well, if you, more than one person had the same thought, does that really make it that great? <laughs> it's like... Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Sorry. Oops. I got it. I got excited and I moved that one. Um, yes. Thank you, uh, Kristen. Yeah. So I think this is really huge, right? Is recognizing um, that situations. And again, I think alcohol, tobacco and other drugs is like a really good example, especially in maybe like, you know, the younger grades, like five, six, where maybe they're not all being exposed maybe many of them aren't even exposed to some of these things. So sort of like that tension of, you know, wanting to be mindful of like how we support like preventative behaviors, but also recognizing that, you know, asking students to do, or maybe a, a, instead of decision-making, like asking students to refuse using ATOD actually doesn't feel that relevant for them because they're not exposed to alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs in, in, you know, right now. So like, how do we find that balance of allowing students to, you know, create situations or respond to situations that are relevant for them and that take into account their differing contexts, right? And I think that's really um, huge. And I feel like there are ways to do it, but I know even for myself, I still have to kind of remind myself to be thinking about like, how do I provide those kind of options for folks? And then yes, the norm at home is such a huge thing. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up. And that's come up too sometimes even again with like ATOD, where people will be like, well, in this community, right, parents often, parents or guardians often allow young people to, you know, consume alcohol if they're at home with them or something, right? So like, then when you're talking about, um, you know, encouraging young people to, to avoid alcohol, if it's a norm in the community, right, th those are all things that we have to really take into account in addition to some of the, um, you know, like specific, um, situations that students are in. Yes, social media is like another really great example, right? So when we're talking about certain things, um, if they're, well, first of all, there could just be a disconnect between what parents and guardians know their students are doing, right? Um, but also thinking about like, how do we make a unit where we're talking about social media relevant for students who might not be on it? Um, or again, <laughs> you know, navigating that tension between um, the sort of parents and guardians not thinking that they are and the young people actually are. I mean, it's kind of, there's, 
this is what I love about health education is, is in as much as I think sometimes like this conversation that we're having can feel a little bit overwhelming. Cause it's like, Oh my gosh, there are so many different things we need to think about when you like shift to a skills-based approach and you really let the students lead, it actually provides a lot of opportunity for this to kind of emerge organically, I think in a way that makes it exciting. So I feel like what I'm hearing you all say, and you can correct me if this is a wrong interpretation, but we need to get our know our students in our community. We need to do the work of understanding different like cultural norms, expectations, create relationships with our families and our communities so that we can, again, support an orientation toward health and well-being while being mindful of the challenges and also being really supportive of like the diverse like cultures and experiences that all of our young people are bringing with them, um, you know, as we try to support them in this work. And that's like huge right there. Right. I mean, that could be the whole thing that we talk about for more than just an hour. Um, and that's really just kind of the context that we want folks to be thinking about, because when you have like the fact that you all are talking about all these things, that means that you're going to be able to make your curriculum more relevant. Right. And you're going to help them to be able to you know, start to understand these systems of like power and privilege and all these things that are, again, directly impacting all of our ability to be healthy and well. Um, so thank you all for engaging in the various ways that you engaged. I'm going to keep going and I keep checking my phone for time. Um, so ultimately, the goal of our skills based approach is like with all everything you just talked about in mind is to help students increase their self efficacy, their belief in their ability to do something so that they have the agency to support, um, main, to support, if there should be like a comma, maintain or enhance personal and community health and well-being, right? So we want to help them to understand where they have control over situations, where they don't. We want them to have strong belief in their ability to do things like make decisions, goal set, analyze influences, advocacy, right? Like all the skills on national standards, because all that contributes to their feelings of agency over like, yes, there are things that I can do to help myself and my community work toward health and well-being. So obviously it's health literacy month. Want to make this connection explicit um, that skills-based health ed is connected to health literacy. So you can see here from this definition of health literacy, and again, I won't read the whole thing this time, but the, the words that are highlighted are that it relates to people's knowledge, motivation, and competencies, right? So knowledge, motivation, and skills um, to access, understand, appraise, and apply health information. So we can already probably see, right, accessing valid and reliable information. In order to apply health information, you're going to need to make decisions. You might need to analyze influences. You might need to advocate for yourself or others, right? So all the kind of core elements of this definition of health literacy, which is, this is just one definition, but we like it because, um, it kind of helps keep it broad and it and it takes a little bit outside of just a medical model, which is where health literacy sort of historically has has sort of lived um, into like how people use this, not only in healthcare, um, but related to disease prevention and then health promotion in general. And then the other thing that kind of I think always every time I see this graphic stands out to me that when you look at this, so this is like another um because it's sort of interesting, like health literacy is one of those um, ideas that depending on what you look at, it's like defined in a lot of different ways. Um, but this is kind of one that we use because it was um, an article about health literacy specifically in youth. And so you can see here um, that in this example, the health literacy is kind of broken down into four buckets. So affective attributes, behavioral attributes, competencies, and cognitive attributes. And when we look across there, there's so many connections to skills-based health ed. Right. So like part of what we do is we help students hopefully develop motivation to, you know, work toward health and well-being, self-efficacy, skills, right? Belief in their ability to do something. Um, self-reflection is going to be a critical part of skills-based health ed. So self-awareness, um, seeking and accessing information. That's one of our standards. Communication, one of our standards. Right. So anyway, I won't go more into it, but basically like almost everything you see on this chart are all things that are connected to skills-based health. So my message for all of you is that when you're doing skills-based health ed, you're also supporting the development of health literacy. And I think that can be a really important message because there's lots of research on health literacy. There's not a lot of research on skills-based health ed or even just health ed in general, unfortunately. Um, there kind of was a lot for a while that sort of lagged in the more sort of recent past. So when you're advocating, you know, or when you're lifting up Health Literacy Month, it's just a great opportunity to show people the ways that 
when you're doing skills-based health ed, you're also developing health literacy. And we know that folks with higher health literacy levels actually have like more positive health outcomes over a lifetime, right? So like, it's just a way to advocate for the work that we're doing. And I think, again, I like this particular graphic because there's so many different connections that you could make. And even things like citizenship, like what it means to be a good citizen ties into what we were just talking about, right? With understanding how like our health, our collective health is all impacted by these bigger factors, right? And like how you, I mean, certainly like how you vote is also going to impact certain things in your community, right? Like it's, in a lot of places, or at least in Massachusetts, a lot of it's actually local control. So like who you, who, who in my community is on my public health board and things like that, they're actually really shaping a lot of what's happening in our community. And that all relates to kind of our civic engagement. So anyway, that's a different talk again for another night. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pause real quick. Any like questions, comments before we kind of dive into some skills-based specific stuff? Okay. Looks like we're good, but if anything comes up or if you're typing, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat and I will definitely attend to that if I can. So let's dive in. We have about half an hour left. So I mentioned this already. One of the big shifts in a skills-based approach is to the focus on skills. So some key ideas here, the national health education standards are the framework and really the focus of your curriculum when you're shifting to a skills-based approach. Really excited for the 2024 release of the new ones. Yay. Um, Skill development happens throughout the unit with most time spent on practice. So that's like another big shift. So first is actually sort of shifting from say like a nutrition unit to an analyzing influences on nutrition unit or shifting from a mental health unit to an advocating for mental health unit. That's kind of like the first box, right? And then the next one is thinking about in each of those units, how am I addressing each step of the skill development model and how much time am I giving students to practice? And that is, I think, one of the biggest things that I hope folks take away from tonight is that one of the things that we really need to think about and look at is that practice piece, because that should be where they're spending the most time is applying and practicing the skills. So sometimes we give the example, and I don't have it on here, so I'm sorry that there's not a visual, but if you think about like a six lesson unit, we often talk about how lesson one might be steps one through three of the skill development model, which I think maybe is next. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go back to the other side, but just like, let's picture this six lesson unit. So lesson one might be what's in red here. So the skill introduction. So you introduce a skill. This is our advocacy unit. You provide a definition for advocacy. You, you ask students like, why do you think it matters that you're able to advocate? And you say, by the end of this unit, you're going to be able to advocate um, you know, to two different audiences about mental health. That's sort of step one. Then step two, here's how you advocate. Here are the steps of advocacy. And you actually outline like, boom, boom, boom. Here are the different critical elements of the skill that you need to do. And then step three, you model it. So that's say all lesson one. Again, just pretend it doesn't always fit in one lesson, but just for the sake of thinking about it. So then maybe lesson two is some functional information, right? So or maybe even two and three, right? But you're helping them think about, like, well, what are some things about mental health that I need to know in order to be able to advocate for it? And then lessons four and five are practice. And then six is the assessment where they're using the things that they use for practice and they're demonstrating that final assessment and transfer, right? And maybe it's even like only lesson two is mental health and then like lessons three, four, and five are all practice. And then lesson six is that final summative assessment that they're actually submitting for evaluation, right? So again, you can see that really the skill was lesson one, lesson maybe three, four, five, and then six is the is the fifth step. So almost the entire unit was focused on skill development, not so much content. So let me go back. Um, one of the reasons why we don't spend as much time on content, there's actually lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that we're essentially using it as the context for helping develop skills, right? So it's hard to learn decision-making without a topic to think about it with, right? It's hard to set a goal about nothing, right? So like we need the content to give us the context for being able to actually use the skill. Um, And again, oh, sorry, those two boxes are the same. I'll have to fix that. Um, But anyway, those are the, those are sort of the main key points around shifting to um, a skill focus. And then again, this is a skill development model that's happening within each of your units. And the reason that skill practice is kind of like the longest box is because it really is where we want to spend the most time. Um, and then we see like assessment is not 
is not actually necessarily the amount of time we're spending on it, but just recognizing that as we're asking students to, um, you know, do a summative assessment, it should be built on practice and it should be relevant and meaningful. Um, and this goes back to what Kristen had put in the chat earlier, to the extent that it's possible, we want to give them options so that they can apply the skill in a way that is meaningful and relevant for them. So again, I'm going to pause and just see if there are any questions, comments. No questions in the chat yet, but no. feel free to drop them in. Okay, then I will keep rolling. Um, so I probably already said some of these things, um, but some instructional considerations, you know, we as the health educators need to get to know the skills. So there's actually a lot more than we, some, or at least I'll speak for myself, than I sometimes think about. I actually had an opportunity to do a project where I took like a deep dive into the um, skills of the national standards. And I was kind of like, actually, you know, really sort of um, surprised, to be honest, um, with like how much I, I, I sort of different understandings that I had as a result of taking a deep dive, even though I've been working with these skills for years, you know, so just really taking the time to kind of get to know the skills themselves, really thinking about choosing skills, because one of the things that's really hard, it was for most of us, we don't have a lot of time, like I was just talking to a teacher about this today, he's like, how do I decide which skills to choose when they're all important, but I can only do like three units of health? Like, yes, that's that's an impossible situation to be in, but we want to try to really think about like which skills are most relevant, for example, for the sixth graders, for the seventh graders, for the eighth graders, and really just trying to focus on the skills that are most relevant and being okay with going for depth rather than breadth, if that makes sense. So Holly and I would advocate for you know, really maximizing your scope and sequence by doing like fewer skills in a year but getting to them maybe like multiple times over your six, seven, eight, or, you know, like nine and 10, um, then trying to do all of them for a short amount of time without doing that sort of deep dive. Cause just again, like in any other skill that you learn, if you're like, okay, two days on this skill, two days on the next skill, two days on the next skill, two, right. You're never, you don't have a chance to actually like really get to proficiency or even competency. Cause you're trying to move so quickly through things. Um, but that's the question. And I will, um, I'm going to leave the question that's in the chat, maybe to Audra um, about some of the messaging about health literacy month. I'm, I know that there are things, but Audra might be um, the better person to answer that question. Um, so again, we're connecting to current issues and events. We want to make sure that all the materials that we use related to skills and skill development are accessible to students. We want to be really intentional about feedback and how we're giving it. So not just like good job, everybody, right, but really thinking about how do we build rubrics and how do we give um, specific feedback, especially that relates to the critical elements of the skill. Um, and again, I've already said this, but I it bears repeating. Um, you know, practice is really the thing that supports self-efficacy, which is also something that we know helps support behaviors outside the classroom. Um, so, so make sure you're really emphasizing that practice opportunity. Th those things, those are the sort of really critical keys to students' ability to transfer this outside the classroom. All right. Um, other things about practice. So we want to make it relevant and realistic for all learners. So again, this goes back to Kristen's point, you know, make sure that you have lots of options, let students create scenarios that they're practicing with, you know, give students some, um, you know, questions that they can think about that might help them, you know, like think about it for themselves. So for example, you could even ask them if you, if you want to give the whole class the same scenario, you might ask them a reflection question, you know, um, does this does this seem relevant for you? Is this something that you feel like you might encounter? Why or why not? Right. Or like what could have been a more relevant um, scenario that we could have worked on for decision making or whatever the case may be. Right. So just even if you can't necessarily or you feel like it's appropriate for everybody to practice the same thing, there are still ways that you can engage in that reflection process around um, helping it helping students see how it's relevant and realistic. I talked about this multiple opportunities for practice. We talked about feedback. We want to make sure that students experience success because you don't build self-efficacy only by practicing. You have to experience success in your practice, right? So the way that I build more confidence in my ability to do something is a chance to practice it and receive affirmation, right? That what I'm doing is the thing that I need to do. Um, and this is something that I tell my students because this sometimes comes up. So a practice opportunity is anything that directly connects to one or more of the skill cues 
that you have presented to students. So I don't know why decision-making is on my mind tonight, but let's just, we'll keep going with it. So decision-making, if you have students do an activity where they're focusing on identifying their own personal values, that's practice because that connects, at least in the model that I use, I use a decide model. The I is identify values and influences that may be impacting the decision. So if they're they're practicing thinking about their internal values and then you use that. So when they go and they do like a full decide model, they have to be able to point back to the values that you identified and, you know, the, the activity in lesson two, what's coming into play here, right? So those are two different practice opportunities where you focus specifically on one element of the skill that's really important. And then you help them use that into the whole thing. Right. So anytime you're anytime you're doing a practice activity where they're focusing on one or more elements of the skill cues or one or more of the more critical elements of the skill, that's a practice. So you can sort of do the whole part whole almost where you sort of break it down where it makes sense. And then you help them um, by providing additional opportunities where they put it all together. So I'm going to like just go through these quickly. Um, um, so I won't go through these tonight, but I just tried to give different examples um, of what practice could look like for different skills um, using the skill cues that I usually use. So you might have different skill cues. So, and that's fine because there's no real one set of skill cues, but just to give you some different examples of like the ways that for different skills, um, you could focus on that sort of like whole part, whole piece. So I'm just going to kind of click through these quickly now, but we'll send them out um, and you can, you can sort of take some more time with them. Um, later, but I, I thought it could be helpful just to give some different examples because there's so many different things that you can do. Um, all right. I see in the chat, thank you. So hard to find activities for students that are skills-based. Um, and yeah, and finding the balance between, you know, what knowledge is needed and like how to support the skill development. So I think, well, actually that's a great lead in. So thanks everybody to our next topic, which is functional information. Um, and also to say that, yes, I think, you know, there are some resources that are on the SHAPE website. There are some, you know, other resources that might be out there in other forums. Um, but we're still, there's still a lot of opportunity for growth and sharing within our community of health educators related to um, like skills-based activities. And I think the other thing that you're sort of elevating that I often think about um, is also being mindful of, um, Thinking about the fact that, and I know this isn't what you're saying, Samantha, it just reminds me of this, um, that skills-based health ed is more than engaging activities, right? So we want to make sure that we're making those connections back to also, like, how do we create engaging activities that are also supporting these other elements that we've been talking about tonight? And that's not always, that's not always easy. Um, and, and then building on the point of, like, how do we find the right sort of tension between, um, yeah, like the knowledge and the skills. And so that leads into our day of functional information. So this is a small, small square there at the bottom of our puzzle from the beginning. So it's the need to know information that's usable, relevant, and applicable. And again, that's going to look different potentially, whether you're in a community, I think someone's coming in from Colorado. I think you mentioned rural Minnesota, Minnesota, right? Minnesota there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Massachusetts, that potentially is all going to look a little bit different. So we could be teaching the same topic, and the way that we teach it, because we're attending to our functional information, looks a little bit different. Why does it matter that we use that we think about functional information? So one reason is the brain can only process so much information at any given time, right? So let's focus on what matters, especially given the limited time that we have. So I think also maybe to the point in the chat, but maybe I'm sort of extrapolating, is that one of the things I think is really hard as health educators is like everything that we would teach them is like so important, right? And so many things that we would teach them are like critical to so many things. And we just don't have the time, right? Like, unfortunately, many of us don't have enough time in health education to actually do all the things. So part of our, part of the difficulty in our job is to then figure out, well, what is that functional information? And how do I maximize the time that I do have with students to focus on that foundational and functional information and support the development of skills that will help them to be able to do that on their own, right? Like once we give them some of these tools, they can actually find the information that they need 
on their own. And that can actually help them as they continue to like grow and develop and change. And as their needs change, the tools stay the same, right? So their ability to access valid and reliable information is basically the same, whether you're in sixth grade or you're, you know, me, like a 41 year old person trying to look up, you know, symptoms on the web, right? Like I'm using the same skills that we're teaching our sixth graders as an adult, right? So those don't change. And that's part of what we want to remember. Um, also keeping in mind that just because we'd like tell them more or include more information in our, you know, curriculum, it doesn't mean they're actually learning more, right? Because when we actually shift to that sort of like student led active learning, it takes longer, right? Like if, if I wanted to engage you even further tonight, we'd get through even less than we're going to get through in the hour, right? So it takes more time when you shift to more active learning strategies and we know that that's how they're going to retain the information. So just like being okay with sort of letting go of some of that in order to have that deeper learning. And we already talked about this next one, so I'll keep going. So I already only have 10 minutes. So I think I said this, but we can't teach students everything they'll ever need to know. Like we just have to be okay with that, even though it's really hard. Um, but we can give them the tools, mindsets, habits, practices, and skills to be able to find what they need over the course of their life. So it took me a while to like, I know it's sometimes it's still hard to kind of grapple with, but I sort of rest into like, if we focus on the tools and the skills, then, then that is okay. Cause again, we're giving them the things that they can use over a lifetime and, you know, information changes, right. Or their context changes or their needs change. So even if we give them certain information that might be like relevant in that moment, it's not going to be relevant forever, right? So like, how do we focus on maybe the information that is sort of more transferable or that is more lasting? Um, when we're including our information, again, it's contextual to our students and our community. We're keeping the information simple. We're trying to chunk the information to support processing. We're providing opportunities for students. Again, I've given some examples to determine what's functional for them. And then think about this from like a 2080 rule. So 20% of the time in your class is focused on information while 80% is focused on application of the info and skill practice, right? So like really emphasizing using information and really emphasizing skill practice with minimal time on that sort of more maybe like direct instruction or focus on new learning. All right, I'll just take a quick pause. I have eight minutes. I'm going to try not to talk too fast, but anything, maybe I'll just invite folks if you have questions about functional information to put that in the chat and I'll keep going just so I can, we can be out on time. Um, so participatory methods, we learn best through observation, modeling, and social interaction. Just like that's like generally true for sort of human beings in general. So we want to use that to our advantage in our health classes. We know that student-centered learning is more effective. It's also more relevant. It's going to connect to their culture and their humanity and their identity. Active learning supports retention and deeper learning. We just talked about that. When we use participatory methods, we're also helping students develop the skills that support critical inquiry, social connection, like all things, again, that we know are important across a lifetime. Um, and learning requires effort. I was just having this conversation with my college students recently. It doesn't mean that learning has to be hard, but it does mean that at the end of the day, for in order for any of us to learn something, we have to do something, right? Like I always say, like, I can't learn you, right? Like I can, I can talk to you for this hour and give you information, but that's not necessarily going to mean that you learn it unless you do something with it, right? And like, unless you're able to sort of apply it or unless you are actually, you know, here and focused and, and able to really sort of pay attention to what we're doing. So there's all these other factors that impact like our actual ability to learn and retain information. And so sometimes I feel like, I don't know if you're experiencing this, but I know um, a lot of folks have shared that they're experiencing pushback from students who are like, just give me the test. I don't want to do a project because they're not necessarily invested in the effortfulness of learning. And that's another whole conversation for another night. But I just want to kind of remind us that, you know, like sometimes we have to figure out as educators, like how do we support the kind of learning that we know is actually more meaningful, even, even in the face of our students being like, just tell me the answer, just give me the multiple choice test and I'll do it you know, I'm not going to do this project, right? Like, how do we actually help them sort of, um, you know, understand this bigger picture of like what learning means and looks like? And hopefully, and again, I know this isn't always the way it works, but like when we 
plan, you know, curricula and activities that are engaging and relevant, it hopefully helps, right, increase that motivation to do a little bit more of the effortful learning and sort of not just be pushing back and saying, I just want the lectures and then give me the multiple choice test and let's call it a day, right? Because we know that that's actually not going to be supportive in the long run. Um, okay. So other things that we want to think about, and this connects back to what we talked about at the beginning around the socio-ecological and socio-cultural perspectives, that we want to be teaching participatory methods through a humanizing pedagogy. So we're especially in health. I mean, this is true in all subjects, but particularly in health, like we want to value students' background knowledge, culture, their life experiences, and create a health classroom that like is shared with students, right? And they have ownership and they're helping determine what that culture should look like. And they're having input, you know, like on the activities and all these other things. So we're, we're creating a, a learning environment where power is shared and we're really honoring and valuing um, students' humanity. We're using culturally responsive and sustaining approaches. We're, we're approaching this through equity and justice lenses. So again, attending to that sort of, you know, as we do the work to understand some of the complexities around the environment that we're in and what has shaped that. Like, how do we present our health education um, in a way that is supportive for young people? I'm actually working with an educator on an article about how to implement nutrition education through an equity lens. There's actually lots of inequity that can be perpetuated in nutrition units, lots of different ways. Um, so like just having that sort of orientation as we're thinking about things, um, using trauma responsive approaches, so at the end of the day, the way I would summarize this slide is we're we're using participatory methods and pedagogy that honors the humanity of each student and that we're really being intentional about thinking about like how are we creating spaces where students can show up as their whole selves? How are we making sure that we're helping students see themselves in the curriculum? How are we helping students see different experiences than their own, um, you know, in the health classroom. I don't know if some folks are familiar with the idea of um, mirrors, windows, and sliding doors from Dr. Bishop, but this idea that like you want to be able to see yourself in the curriculum, you want to be exposed to other ways of being, and then sliding doors actually kind of goes into like imaginary worlds, but mirrors and windows um, is something to think about so that we can make sure that everybody has a mirror and windows in your health curriculum. Um, Okay, I'm going to keep going, but again, please put anything in the chat, but I want to try to leave some time if we can um, for just open questions. So the other piece that we do want to address in our health classrooms are attitudes and motivations. Essentially, I'll summarize this slide by saying um, our job as health educators is not to say like, this is the attitude that you should have, right? Um, but rather like, let's investigate this, right? And provide opportunities for critical thinking and help students kind of the way I think about it is like help them orient toward health and well-being without saying like, here's what you have to do, right? Or here's how this has to look. Because that's a whole other top that we could talk that we could do, which is even thinking about the way that we define health or healthy. I mean, there's a whole thing we could do, right? And the reality is for everyone on this call, plus everyone who's watching the recording later, what it means for me to be healthy is probably a little bit different than everybody else on this call, right? Like we all have different things that we're sort of figuring out for ourselves. So we have to be mindful of that as we're working towards supporting those attitudes and motivations. So mainly we're doing that through critical thinking, self-reflection and those kind of opportunities. Um, I think I have said most of this. I came up with this little analogy too of like you're we're helping them like set their barometer toward health and well-being, which doesn't mean that they're like always there, but they have a sense of like, mm, like maybe I just did something that's like not quite as, you know, health promoting as it could be. So, you know, we all still probably make choices that aren't always the most health enhancing or health promoting, but like we have that sense of like, mm, you know, maybe I could be doing something differently. Um, we want to help them connect to whatever their motivations are for certain things. We're not necessarily judging what those reasons are. So even if they're like not why we would choose to do something, they have a reason to work toward that health and well-being. That's great. Um, we're supporting critical inquiry, self-awareness and growth. I know I'm going really fast. We don't have time for this activity. Um, so what I'll end with in one whole minute that we have um, is what are the questions like wonderings or again, aha moments that maybe you have around skills-based health ed um, after this hour that went by so fast. So fast. Hi, Lisa so Blasey. My colleague Carrie is on here also and she, we're elementary school health teachers in Woburn, Massachusetts. Oh. And one of the things on here was how um, 
it's been difficult transitioning to more skills based in elementary because they don't have a lot of that foundation Mm -hmm. knowledge yet. And sometimes finding, you know, meaningful activities or engaging activities with the really young kids um, can be difficult. And so we're working really hard to try to find that balance um, where they're getting that knowledge that they don't have, but able to practice those skills. And, and we do, we're fine, you know, we're getting better, but we're, we're a work in progress right now, really um, yeah. with it. Yeah, no, thank you is. for sharing. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think every, yes, I mean, everything you said is 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 spot on. And I think the other thing that's kind of interesting to reflect on, particularly in elementary, is also that the skills look a little different, right? So like developmentally, I mean, the expectations are different too. So it's like sort of trying to figure out like what that then looks like in a way that we're, you know, supporting that skills-based approach and also recognizing that they probably do need more scaffolding, right? And they might need a little bit more, you know, support to get to where we want them to go because of the age that they're at, right? Um, And certainly, unfortunately, there is a lack of especially elementary related resources for health ed just in general, um, let alone skills based health ed. Um, But yeah, and I'm right down in Natick in Massachusetts. So, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. (laughs) Thank you. you Appreciate it. Um, Yeah, Nicole. Hi. Hi. So. I am brand new to teaching middle school health. And so I started recently digging into the curriculum to pull the slides and pull all the worksheets and kind of start looking through all the lessons. And I now need to go back and make sure that I'm not just teaching to the slides that I am giving enough practice time. (laughs) Um, Because we all also are doing AVID and other, there's so many other things in that lesson. And then in that time that now I think I'm actually going to delete a few things. So that was my aha moment. (laughs) Um, I'm coming from teaching elementary PE and now I'm teaching middle school PE. And I think it's the same idea of giving that practice time and starting, you know, that skill those lead up skills that we do even in PE before the game. Like I feel like yes. I, I can still use that thing, that thinking. So that yeah. was my aha moment. Awesome. Thank you. And I really appreciate <laughs> that you shared that like you need to delete. Cause that's like one of the biggest things, like when I go into districts and I work with folks, I'm like, you know, hang in there with me, but like, you are going to probably have to get rid of things that you're doing. And that's hard, right? Cause a lot of times it can even be activities that we feel like, you know, we really like or enjoy, but like when you start reflecting on like how it connects to the broader purposes and like, you know, how we kind of balance out needing practice, sometimes we do need to delete things and it's usually okay. Even though that like time when you have to actually delete this, you know, like delete feels really hard. And then you're like, oh, this is okay. Like when I first started doing this work, I met with this teacher and I will still remember, she was so funny. She was so open. She was like, when I first had to transition to a skills-based approach, she was like, I was angry because I really had to go through and get rid of a lot of the stuff that I did. But then she turned into like one of the biggest advocates for skills-based health ed, sort of like once you got, you know, once she got over that. So I really appreciate you kind of putting that out there because that's definitely a hard part about it. And hopefully I think you'll find it's true that in the end it will be helpful and you'll be able to have other different kind of opportunities where students are practicing. Um, and Thank yes, you. I also want to shout out to um, that it is awesome that there is even health education in the K-5 setting, Lisa and Carrie, um, because I know that that doesn't happen very often either. And I want to make sure as we're continuing to talk, um, here is my contact information. So everyone is welcome to reach out with further questions. Happy to support all of you in any way that I can. I don't know if you can tell, but like, I love doing this work um, and talking about this. So I'm really happy to help you all however I can. Um, you know, hard to practice when emotions are like not sort of in that moment. Um, And then, you know, to make it not be boring and drawn out. So yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of things that we have to sort of think about. And that goes back to that idea of like the relevance, right? And sort of how do we make it as relevant as possible while recognizing that like maybe the way that we have to support students around anger management, like isn't as um, 
like we can't replicate that, right? So like then how do we sort of help them in the best way possible? And maybe it's things like we're giving them tools and then we say, you know, next time something happens where you're finding yourself in a situation, see if you can practice this, right? So even if you sort of can't really mimic that in the classroom, just helping to continue to make those transfer opportunities um, for them to be thinking about that or even, and I'm sure you already do this, right? But like having them think about, well, how do I know when I'm angry? Like, what does that feel like in my body so that they're developing that sort of self-awareness? So again, even if you can't quite replicate the situation, because most of the time we really can't, right? Um, but we help them to sort of think about and reflect on those pieces. Um, yeah, and certainly we want to make it relevant and engaging. And that's one of the things that I think as we start to really shift toward providing more opportunities for students to help us lead, it doesn't always solve that problem, but it often can help us to, as they get more ownership, it becomes more engaging because they're more a part of like, you know, they're literally helping co-create what's happening. Um, yeah, no worries. Thanks, Samantha. And seriously, feel free to like email if you have further questions or, you know, I'm happy to also jump on Zoom calls with folks. I mean, whatever people need, I'd love to support your skills-based health ed journey. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thank you all for joining us, whatever time it is. I it, I know some of you on the East Coast, it's fairly late. Hopefully you're have, you've got dinner coming up soon. Um, I'll follow up with the recording and the slides and feel free to continue this conversation in the Exchange Online community where you can network, share resources, and you know continue this conversation. I want to thank, obviously, our presenter this evening, uh, Sarah Bennis, our president this <laughs> year, um, and also to the Health Education Council for their planning of all of the things that are happening this October for Health Literacy Month. Special shout out to Stacy who yes. was playing yeah. backup and keeping an eye on the chat. And then obviously I want to acknowledge those of you that are teaching kiddos health education because y'all are real rock stars changing real lives. And um, I'm honored that I get to support you in that work. So thank you so much. Have a good evening and uh, take care. Bye everyone. Bye, everybody.